So this is James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast, and I have been asked a lot of times lately a very simple question that I think I should take time to answer, and that's, how am I not crazy? So a lot of you will know, but not everybody will know, that I spend more or less my entire day every day reading the academic literature in fields like gender studies and so on, what we call grievance studies and is generally call this critical social justice now. I spend more or less my entire day, every day, reading this stuff, writing this stuff, looking at examples of this stuff happening in the world, taking it on, trying to communicate it to people, and I get asked all the time, how are you not crazy? How is it not eating your mind away? And I think um, it does do that to people. I think it does get into their heads and seeing it a lot does make them feel crazy. Uh, it definitely is really out there. It's frustrating. It's making a lot of headway into our institutions. And it seems to be kind of everywhere. And then we get gaslighted about it all the time. We get told it's not really happening. The most recent big example of a public gaslighting would have been with uh, the Me Too movement and the claim that believe women didn't imply believe all women, and there wasn't this huge meltdown about this, where we were all supposed to believe all women, or we were some kind of awful person, and most of us lost friends on the left if we didn't go into this kind of very ridiculous anti-due process, believe all women mentality in response to accusations of sexual assault or harassment or rape. And... Then all of a sudden, of course, we had a what appears very much so to be a bogus accusation made against Joe Biden, and apparently the rules all changed. And public gaslighting, we never really meant what we very clearly argued, ensued, and it drives people nuts. And so people ask me all the time, how are you not crazy? Are you okay? They're checking on me all the time. It's because I basically live in this stuff. Um, so I want to talk about how I'm not crazy because I'm not actually crazy. Um, I don't think, I don't feel crazy. Maybe that's a symptom, but, uh, this is not going to be one of those podcasts where I'm going to talk to you about how, oh, well, I try to get a lot of exercise. I'm pretty bad about it. Actually, I used to be good at it and it just kind of fell apart. It's not going to be about eating right, managing sleep. It's not going to be about drinking or not drinking. It's not going to be about going outside. It's not going to be about taking walks or getting into something like relaxing, like fishing. It's not going to be about blowing off stress or steam, doing whatever. It's not going to be anything like that. Those can all help. I mean, find what works for you um, if you need to. There's also not going to be a podcast specifically about tuning out and unplugging like turning off all of your social media for a month or whatever and taking a diet. Um, at least it won't be that completely. We will talk about unplugging a little bit. Um, clearly, though, I'm not unplugged, and that's what the question's about. I am plugged straight into this stuff, and I don't go crazy. And so that's what I want to explain. But I am a little bit more unplugged than you might think, and so I would urge you to start to figure out with start to figure out what you should unplug from. So let me give you kind of a idea here to think about. Imagine that you had to live in some room that made like really annoying random sounds all the time and not some steady sound that your brain could learn to tune out, but some random irritating beeping or grating sound or something you just can't stand and can't tune out. And it happens at weird intervals so that you can't really control it. I think you would go nuts. Um, most of us would go nuts. So to give you a sense of this, a couple of quick stories, three of them really. Um, the other day, to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, I was trying to read some fairly difficult philosophy book for this work that I always do. And my neighbor was using his weed eater for like 45 minutes straight with no break, just running that thing. And by the end of it, I was seriously screaming at the sky for him to stop it just i think i yelled out loud at nobody for him to stop it it was driving me absolutely bonkers um similarly a friend of mine was talking to me earlier today and 
He lives on a road that leads to the famous Dragon, which is a, a, a mountain road between Tennessee and North Carolina. It's actually very famous for how many curves it has. It's apparently very fun to drive. Um, it's actually motorcycle heaven. So my friend lives on the road to the Dragon, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of loud motorcycles go by every day. And it's, of course, a seasonal thing, and now is the season. Um, so this is usually tolerable, but some days it just drives him absolutely nuts. Um, on the other hand, speaking of road noises, I used to live right next to Interstate 40 uh, in Knoxville, in the city. And it was very annoying to live that close to the road at first, especially when I was trying to sleep. But after a few weeks, I started to hear the highway kind of like a river, and I started to find it relaxing. And I could actually go to sleep better hearing the highway than not. And it didn't even bother me like when the trucks would pull their jake brakes and make that big rumbling sound. Um, those are the kinds of sounds you can adapt to, but these intermittent, like, unexpected, the, the weed eater, the... The loud motorcycles at irregular intervals, those are hard to adapt to. And they can drive you nuts. Um, and so that makes kind of a metaphor for why I'm not crazy and uh, why you might wonder if you are in our current social and cultural and political environment. Um, we're subjected to constant irritating noises that are outside of our control and those are of kinds that are very, very hard to adapt to. Those are the kinds we have to unplug from, whereas we don't necessarily have to unplug from everything. So let me just say this straight. Um, I have a very negative opinion about news now. Uh, news is noise. Uh, so I, I really want that to be clear. News is noise. So if you want to unplug from something to immediately make yourself feel saner, turn off cable news. All of it. Mostly treat what you see on the internet, if it's news, as noise. Um, you run into a lot of Trump, Trump everywhere. Uh, there's social justice stuff and people yelling about it. They use the same dynamics, both of these people hyping everything up, making a big drama out of it, getting people's attention by saying something outrageous. Everything sensational. Everything is the most important thing in the world at the moment, and none of it's really all that important or not much of it. Um... I've had a previous podcast where I talked about how I feel like we live in post-modernity now, and as in an age of narratives, I called it, and it gives off this feeling in this kind of news environment, that constantly conflicting news and interpretation of news and pundits and con contextualization and narrative, where, as my friend said, and I resonated with it, I, I don't know how to tell what's true anymore. Uh, I feel like I don't know what I can believe. I feel like that more strongly when I pay attention to the news than when I don't. Um, so it's not that it's, whether it's real news or fake news, it's that it's both actually at the same time. It's some news is real, some news is fake, which makes it, and I'm pretty much every outlet, which makes it more or less impossible to tell which is which, which eats into your head. It's just not a good place. And then you, it's all so loud. Cable news is terrible for this. It's all punditry. It's some talking head who seems to know everything. He's wrong about almost everything he says, but he says it with so much confidence every time. And there's squabbling, and let's bring in this fake expert and that person and give them three minutes to not explain anything. Let's put it all in terms of opinion. Let's contextualize. Let's put five or seven people on a panel and let them yell at each other over each other for their five to seven minutes, which isn't long enough to say anything, especially in a group. So this creates an age of narratives. And I said it's like living in post-modernity because it feels like everything's a simulation. It feels like truth somehow hides in which side your politics are. Your side is true for you. Their side is true for them. And no, nowhere in between is actual truth. And then on top of it, everything's so sensational. Sensationalism sells. So they're, of course, they're going to be sensational. The news has an overwhelming pressure, especially this 24-hour cable news. There's not that much news. So they have to be sensational to try to get your attention. They have to be over the top. It really interferes with your sanity. It's not helping you. Turn it off. Just turn it off. News is noise. Um... Politics is pretty much the same. Politics is bullshit. I know a lot of you that listen to me 
are very interested in politics. I'm going to tell you, you should avoid it probably a lot more than you do, mostly. I'm going to drop some truth bombs, as they say on you here. <laughs> First of all, um, this goes for me too, by the way, uh, but your political opinion doesn't matter much. Um, chances are political things are really complicated. They're kind of far away. They involve a lot of factors. Most of us don't know nearly enough about any of them unless we're actual experts in those domains to be able to say much about politics that means much of anything. Even when we can, or even when it's really close to us or really important to us, though, we still all invest way too much of our time and energy learning about politics and arguing about politics Politics, if we care about politics. But we're not really learning about politics, usually. Um, we're just entrenching ourselves on our sides. They're wonderful study the uh, per, uh the, the what was it perception gap study that talked about how each side perceives the views of the other side and how far away from the actual views of the other side it is and it showed very very clearly that the more one engages with the news the wider their perception gap is the more wrong they are we've seen this for years now shockingly it was just this huge shock when we found out that people who watched The Daily Show, not the real news, were the most informed about the news, or people who watched no news were the most informed about the news. This has been over 10 years that this has been the case. Watching the news is not informing you about politics. It's informing you about your side's view of politics, and it's just entrenching you further. It's actually making you more wrong, and it's pissing you off consistently. One show after another after another saying, hey, look at this example of the other side doing something terrible. Hey, look how bad this person is. Hey, look how bad that is. Hey, everything, it's sensationalism that's trying to suck you in and get in your head. And you think you're learning about politics and actually all you're doing is entrenching yourself and pissing yourself off. You don't need this. You don't need this in your life. I, I went through a calculation at one point, being the dorky math kind of guy that I am, and I figured out that we should really only be paying attention as average citizens to, to the news maybe for 10 minutes a day at the most. 10 minutes a day. If you're spending more time reading political garbage, looking at political garbage, watching political news, talking about it, arguing about it, getting in fights on Twitter about it in a day, more than 10 minutes, you're probably doing something wrong. And if you cut it out, you'll be happier, and chances are you'll be less misinformed so kind of more informed as a result. The calculation, if you want to know, was pretty straightforward. I tried to figure out how much money would I be willing to donate, given how much money I make, given what I think works in my budget, how much money would I be willing to donate to a political cause that I particularly care about, figured out that it's honestly not that much, uh, maybe per year, worked out how many hours at, a, say, a 10 or 15 hour or a dollar an hour job would I be willing to to work to fund that and figured out that if I pay attention to politics for more than 10 minutes a day, I would actually be better off getting a crappy part-time job and making some money and throwing it at the political cause that I care about. There's no justification for spending more than about 10 minutes a day paying attention to political news. Um, so that thing you were going on Twitter and spending all day yelling about, um, if it's politics anyway, you're probably not moving the needle on it almost at all. Your political opinion just isn't that important. It's not worth that much. And your neighbor's political opinion doesn't matter much either. That's why you're on there, because stupid people or evil people have the wrong opinions, or even worse, good people have stupid and evil opinions that you have to fix. Well, your your neighbor's political opinions, uh, and I'm using neighbor in a loose sense, are one of two things. They're your friend's political opinions, or they're some asshole's political opinions, and political opinions are almost irrelevant to friendships. When I wrote How to Have Impossible Conversations with Peter Boghossian, the primary motivation I had to participate in the book and the primary thing I wanted to bring to that book was my unchosen lifetime of experience living with one set of political and religious views in a uh, social and political milieu that doesn't match. Um, I'm very much a, a liberal and I'm very much an atheist, and I grew up in the very conservative, very religious, in fact, very Protestant, southeastern United States. Even when I was a kid and I was religious, I was Catholic in a Protestant environment, and these differences matter. Um, well, I wanted to write 
about how you can stay friends across political divides, kind of that Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's view, you know, not letting a difference of politics or religion or philosophy coming between friends. That was really my main motivation and my contributions to how to have impossible conversations. And I realized just how irrelevant politics have to be in most of my friendships. And that that's kind of intentional, but it's actually easy to maintain. Um, so I wrote sections that I consider to be the most important ones in the book, like um, switch to learning and let your friends be wrong. I, I just think that's so important. Now, maybe it's not your friend, though. Maybe it's just some asshole on the internet or somebody you don't really like. Um, well, frankly, they get one vote and so do you. So just go cancel their vote out if you disagree with them. Why, why are you arguing? You're actually making more of the noise that's driving you and everybody else crazy. You're wasting your time. You're creating more division, more enmity. You're not solving the problem. And in the off chance that you manage to change that dude's mind, chances are it's just that one vote. I mean, unless you're really able to be generating a movement and face it, most of us aren't. Um, you're putting an awful lot of effort into mostly creating noise. And noise is the thing that's hard to unplug from and drives us crazy. So unplugging from the noise doesn't just mean not listening to it. It means not making it. Um, as for politics in general, the day-to-day -day stuff is almost all a waste of time to pay attention to anyway. Whatever's happening at the federal level in almost all cases, you don't need to know the day it's happening. You don't need to know while it's happening. Very, very rarely is anything happening at the federal or state level that's so big of a deal that you have to be paying attention to it in real time or even within the few hours after or even the day or two after. And think about how much Trump's a, such a great example for this as part of his whole, I don't know if it's intentional or whatever, she can't remember half the stuff he did like three days ago. Most of the stuff that most of this that, that's happening, you do, somebody's got to be paying attention. Somebody has to keep an eye on it, of course. And it's, but in the day-to-day, -day, minute to minute stuff, most of it doesn't matter. It's noise. That's pundit ter territory. It generates lots of pointless news, most of which you actually don't need to engage with. It doesn't really achieve much else except generating that noise that it's hard to unplug from that gets into your head and makes you crazy. And besides, stories when they first come out are typically wrong. And the hot takes aren't helping. Um, the fuller story, the more sober story, the funny haha -ha, hot takes or whatever that are poisoning our discourse will all, all kind of like clarify over time, right? So you have a clearer, fuller story. Even if you just wait a day or two, you're not going to hear as much of it. And you're only going to hear stuff that actually mattered enough to last two days, three days, four days, two weeks, whatever it is. So the answer isn't to say no to politics completely, unplug completely. You actually do have to pay attention to this stuff because it does matter to some degree, but you need to do far less. Try not to be political with other people so much, and more importantly, really, don't be your politics. Don't try to live your political identity. I mean, that's boring. If one of the first things you need to do to introduce yourself is to say that you're a liberal or a progressive or a uh, conservative or a libertarian or worse, pick your favorite identity pol politics, that you're a fat activist, that you're a black activist, that you're a queer activist, that you're a worse white activist, male activist, or some nonsense like this, that you're a feminist. It's boring. Don't be your politics. This is where we've really gone wrong, is by being our politics. Um, again, you're way more likely to be wrong if you identify with your politics than if you don't. And you're way less likely to change your mind about stuff you're wrong, wrong about because now you identify with it. It's who you are. You've made yourself into your politics, which you're probably wrong about. And you've entrenched your, it's just a disaster how far you've entrenched yourself. If you want to unplug, you have to start unplugging from that. And you want to unplug from people who are pushing in that way. So maybe you feel like you're a conservative. Well, people who go out of their way to identify as conservative, it's not that you have to go listen to liberals or progressives or whoever else. It's that you should probably listen less to people who intentionally identify as conservative. Think about it for a second. But if you're going to be your politics, you're going to be boring. You're going to be annoying. You're going to be hard to like. Um, you're going to have lots of 
fun political friends who aren't like deeper friends. You're, you're a low dimensional human and you're going to be constantly frustrated because your identity is tied up in your political mission and pol politics are so fraught and so contentious. Um, unplug, unplug from that. So you got to unplug from the comments section too. It's utterly infuriating. It is, in fact, the comment section on the internet, whatever version that takes, whatever form that takes, is, is a crazy pills dispenser. Okay, it is, it is the crazy pill dispenser. So if you want to know how I'm not crazy, and I know, I know people are going to talk about my Twitter right now, but it really has a lot to do with how much I do and how much I don't connect to the comment section, which for me is on Twitter because I don't really look anywhere else. When you're on social media, what you end up running into is a ton of cognitive dissonance. That's the main dynamic. That's how it eats into your head. So people have cognitive dissonance from things they read on the internet. They mostly live in their own little ideological bubble for the most part. And then they stumble upon or have advertised to them something that goes against that view. It's how they get radicalized, by the way. You live in a mostly safe space and you get fed a steady diet of uh, stuff that drives you crazy that the other side is doing that's stupid or evil. It's road to radicalization right there, baby. Uh, so people get this cognitive dissonance when they run into stuff they disagree with and they comment not because they have something meaningful to say. They're making noise. They comment to alleviate their cognitive dissonance. And then they wait to see what the replies do, the likes, the retweets, the comments back. Because everyone that agrees alleviates that cognitive dissonance further. But then their comments are going to come in. You know, Twitter's a real-time deconstruction machine. Comments are going to come in that go against what you wanted to have happen, which is to alleviate your cognitive dissonance. And that's going to generate more cognitive dissonance. This is a downward spiral. This is a cognitive dissonance spiral. That will make you crazy. Twitter notifications, not necessarily Twitter, your feed, but Twitter notifications is a comment section. You've got to unplug from it. I've got, good Lord, I've got to unplug from it. I'm so much happier when I'm not engaging with that and so much less happy the more I engage with it. It's fascinating. Um, but Facebook, you know, the replies, that's a comment section. Um, you pick your favorite social media, you pick your favorite article, you know, format, whatever, the comments at the bottom. Don't read the comments. Don't engage with the comments. You want to minimize your engagement with the comments section. Um, you don't have to argue or answer everything you see. If you can catch yourself, if you can train yourself in the moment, like cognitive behavioral therapy, to ask yourself, am I just experiencing cognitive dissonance because of what I just read? And if you catch yourself and realize that the answer is yes, you don't have to argue. You don't have to answer. You can just let it go. It can be really hard but you actually don't have to do it. Uh, on social media, it's really hard because it's public and you feel like your reputation's on the line. You feel like your credibility as, as somebody who can speak or know things has been now ex you know, exposed as, as bad to maybe thousands of people. Uh, chances are most people aren't reading most of your comments that you receive to your, your, say your tweets or whatever. Most people just ignore it. Um, you don't have to respond that that emotional response makes you an unpaid employee of Twitter while more or less making you crazy. You don't have to give into it. Um, for myself, we'll just go into that side for a second. I am actually very cognizant and I've actually tracked it a little bit with some subjective assessments and graphs and stuff, but I actually feel the most sane when I engage with my Twitter notifications the, the least. It is even when I'm primarily engaged in positive notifications, those off comments come in and they eat into your head. So I'm most saying, get this, when I'm focusing on the work, which means reading crazy stuff, literally crazy stuff, all day. So I read and write all day long about upside down, crazy town, critical social justice that people are fully convinced must be making me insane. And that's when I'm sanest is when I'm doing that. Um... That's because while that material can be shocking and somewhat difficult to understand, it is actually comprehensible. The grading, the comment section makes those noises, that weedier, that, you know, 
that random loud motorcycle that goes by that you just you can't ignore it and it gets under your skin it gets into your head so reading the social justice stuff for me generates some cognitive dissonance sometimes but it doesn't generate cognitive dissonance spirals because i can actually read it to try to understand it and that alleviates the dissonance rather than making it worse so once i start to understand what it's getting at the dissonance goes away completely. Now I kind of really understand it, which is what we're really going to talk about. And that makes me less crazy. You don't get crazy when you understand a thing, even if it's it itself is crazy. Um, so every time I get a little further in understanding critical social justice theory, I get less dissonance the next time I read it. Very few things that I run into. Sometimes I hit things that surprise me. Non-consensual puberty in the trans studies stuff threw me for a loop the other day, but it's very rare that I hit something that surprises me even. Um, but this almost never happens in the comments sections. Um, so only very rare people can actually go live in the comment sections and not lose their marbles. Um, it's very easy to be driven crazy when you live inside other people's thoughts all the time. And that's the thing. By the nature of our interactions on social media, not by what we're studying, we're all forced to live in other people's thoughts all the time these days. Um, if we go back to politics, nobody in the world is better at taking up your mental real estate than Trump. Um, this extends to all the raging Trump commentary, which is relentless, whether it's supporting him, whether it's against him. This has also been, by the way, crazy around the politics of the, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, you really just got to turn most of that off. Uh, there's no breaking news in politics that you need to know in the real time. There, there just isn't any. Uh, the president taking up your mental real estate when you literally can't do anything about it in almost all cases isn't, you're, you're not achieving anything by digging into and, and dealing with that more. You're trying to find a resolution to cognitive dissonance and you can't find it. So you go online to try to find it and you just make yourself matter uh, because you trigger all those loops. You know, you go in there, you go, I'm going to make myself feel better by crapping all over Trump. I'm going to yell at Trump on Twitter. And then you get, you know, a thousand comments. But I do. <laughs> So maybe you get a dozen comments back or whatever. You get all these comments back. Half of them are probably bots or trolls. They're not even real that are just tuned in to piss off people, piss off the whole internet about politics. And you, all you do is go on these dissonance spirals. And so it's like you went on the internet to alleviate your dissonance, but, and you created a dissonance spiral and made it worse. Turn it off. Back up. Don't pay attention to it. Um, critical social justice is completely different. In this regard, it literally wants in your head, but it's actually a lot easier to ignore than Trump, for the most part, at least until it shows up close enough to you. Um, if it shows up at your work, you have to take some weird diversity training, or it shows up in your kid's school, or your kid comes home from school and shows you some assignment, or, or says some crazy thing about racism, or about hating America or something like this that they clearly picked up. Or they tell you, I mean, this seems to be happening more and more often that you know, some drag queen came in and did a dance for them in the library or some crazy something. Um, critical social justice is generally relatively easy to ignore until it shows up too close to you. Um, but the problem with that is that it actually does want to control how you use words because it wants you to think like it wants you to think. And so because it's so vigorous in policing that, uh, and it, because it is actually trying to reprogram pretty much everybody to be in line with it, uh, once it does make itself in your awareness, you have to think about its rules all the time. Um, of course, social media, we've covered that to, to rather copious extent, but it can, it can do that too if you over-engage with it. You get kind of caught in these spirals where you're looking for social satisfaction by proxy on social media, and it just makes you more miserable because it's not working. It's not giving you what you want. So, that said, it can be utterly bewildering not to know what's going on, and this is generally stress stressful. It can make you feel like you've been eating crazy pills. Um, so there are two kind of problems here. One is the question of how can this even be happening, which leads into, you know, what is it that I can believe? I don't know how to tell what's true anymore. We live in this age of narratives. The solution to that is to actually know what's going on. We're going to talk mostly about that from here. 
Um, the other problem is harder, and I think that's actually where the insanity lies. So if you want the short answer to how am I not crazy is I try to minimize living in other people's thoughts. I'm so very, very clear now that living in other people's thoughts is what will drive you nuts. If you understand the other stuff, say social justice or even how Trump operates, it doesn't drive you crazy. Um, it's you interfacing with the crazy that makes social media, for example, so much worse than something like uh, crazy social justice theory. Again, that's cognitive dissonance that lead to dissonance spirals, and the solution there is to unplug as much as is reasonable. So you want to unplug from these things that you don't have to engage in that make you crazier. But because we live in a world filled with Trump and social justice and these other things, understanding it actually uh, the knowledge is power thing is sort of a thing. So understanding it actually takes away that dissonance. It lessens the dissonance over time. And so I don't get crazy when I read social justice literature or write social justice literature anymore. Uh, it doesn't bother me. It did it first and it doesn't anymore because I actually understand what's going on. I will admit I'm somewhat less good at unplugging. I do better at times and worse at times, but it, I am getting effective enough at unplugging from social media that I made a lot of headway with it. Um, news and politics for me are almost no problem now. I just am not interested. I don't care what's on the news. I'm not very interested in the political nitty gritties. Um, big, broad brushstroke pictures after the fact are more than enough to be politically informed. So I don't feel like I need to look at it or engage with it or freak out about it or whatever. I definitely don't need to argue about it on social media. I just don't care. Like, most of the time, if I make a really political post, it's like specifically political on Twitter. I just mute the conversation before I see anything that comes back. I just don't care. I don't care about people's political opinions. And I want to shield myself from that dissonance spiral inducing commentary that's going to come in. Um, so that's the unplugging. But that's not the work. How do I not go crazy working with critical social justice all the time? That's what people want to know about. And again, I don't go crazy because I kind of know what's going on with the crazy stuff. I understand it now. I used to laugh to cope with it, but eventually the laughing kind of stopped. It's like it's not funny anymore. It's like it's a little bit too much everywhere to be funny anymore. But it's also that I understand it too well to laugh. I read it and it's not absurd or ridiculous so much anymore. Um, I know why it's happening and it doesn't stress you out. It's not, it's not all that funny either. Sometimes it's funny. I mean, I did a pretty good laugh track for myself, some jokes about the non-consensual puberty thing. Um, laughing does really work, though. It does help. So try to find ways to make stuff fu funny, and it helps. Understanding actually works way better, and it's not transient. It really lasts if you can understand it. Um, it doesn't drive you crazy, so you don't go crazy. <laughs> um, so if you read this kind of stuff without understanding it though what it, you end up thinking is that either the world has gone nuts or you did and a lot of us tend to blame ourselves because how in the universe can the whole world be nuts but it turns out no the world is actually losing its, its mind not you or at least the loud part that we're interfacing with on the internet all the time and so we're living inside other people's thoughts they're pushing their way into our head and they're the crazy ones so no wonder we feel crazy Trump was really bad. I mean, I have had a very hard time adjusting to the, whether it's, it's not a matter of whether I like the politics. It's not a matter. It's nothing to do with that. I get asked all the time, oh, well, name one thing Trump did politically. I don't care. The fact that the guy is a walking irritant is enough to get into my head. You can say that that's orange man bad. You can say whatever you want about it. But the fact of the matter is that the guy is disrupting norms left, right, and center. He's obnoxious in many regards. And you can't say he's not because the people who uh, support him most love that about him. And they say they love that about him. I point out, for example, sometimes that Trump is a, that he's, He's playing the critical theory or postmodern game, and he, they'll say, how? And I say, well, you know, this video that he posted or this meme that he posted or whatever, that's actually, that is a textbook Derridian, like Jack Derrida deconstruction of the office of the president. And they say back to me, well, it needs to be deconstructed. So they, 
don't deny it. The guy is a, he, he is intentionally violating these norms. He's doing it like crazy. He is actually deconstructing the office of the president and the people who put him in office and who support him like that he's doing it. So we're, let's not bullshit about whether or not it's happening. It's certainly happening. This was very difficult for me to get used to. This was a lot of cognitive dissonance that uh, the stateliness of an office as high and powerful as the presidency is going to be occupied by somebody who's making a joke out of it. It's not a joke. It's important. It matters. And so this really ate into me and, until I understood that it's a critical and postmodern game that he's playing. It's Whether he's the mastermind of it, I don't know. Um, but he's playing an intentionally anti-expertise game, and it makes his moves fairly predictable. The stuff that happens in his office hasn't surprised me in a few months, and it stops stressing me out. It's like, oh, yeah, of course that's what's going to happen. I can't necessarily predict what he's going to do, but when it happens, it's like, you know, of course it's what it is. He's just trying to piss on expertise. Why didn't he wear a mask in front of the media? Well, he wanted to troll the media because that's one of the things he does. The other thing is because it shows anti-expertise. You can get into all the psychology about yeah, I, I like to not psychologize people if I can, but you can get in all this psychology about, oh, he's trying to portray, portray strength and manliness and all this strongman crap and this is fascism and blah, 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 blah. A lot of people do that. It's simpler than that. The experts said wear a mask. He doesn't believe in the experts. His base doesn't believe in the experts. They don't want there to be experts telling people what to do, so he doesn't wear a mask. It's as simple. Once you see the game, it's not, it doesn't stress you out anymore. You can actually even do something about it if you understand it. But when you don't understand it, the, the, the meme that people are just screaming at the sky is true. And who screams at the sky? Crazy people. Um, so understanding it lowers the crazy. And uh, these kinds of people on both sides, social justice people for sure are doing it, all of them. What we have to realize is that, as I said in a previous podcast, is that these people are playing a different game than the rest of us are playing. Right? And if you don't know that, and you think they're playing the same game we're playing, but it's all weird and hard to understand, you feel like you're taking crazy pills. But the second you do, you're not happy about it, but you're not crazy. So when you understand the game, and I can't urge this enough, you have to get, you have to understand. It's, I'm sorry, you have to do some work. You've got to reach up to the middle shelf to get the cookies down here. You've got to understand the game and it'll stop driving you crazy. How does this work I do not make me crazy? Because I took the time to understand it at least enough. So it's the same thing for woke. It's the same thing for Trump. It's the same thing for the media, uh, which is always sensationalizing. It all looks crazy, but the second that you actually understand it, that it's a game that they're playing, it's a different game than we're playing, and you understand it, that it has its own terms, and you learn what those terms are, it just becomes kind of annoying, and it won't make you crazy. So you don't go crazy. That's how I don't go crazy, by the way. So on the one hand, I know what they believe. The they is going to be the people making us crazy here. It's very broad they. I would like to say that it's broadly speaking the critical theorists and the most broad understanding of that. And I understand that that's a complete mindset. And yes, I file Trump under the critical theory banner. The movement that is called Trumpism sometimes is a fundamentally critical theory movement. Uh, I won't go into the details of that yet. I'm still a little bit light on them, but it is fundamentally critical theory. Um, it is critical government studies. If you want to put it like critical fat studies, critical gender studies, critical government studies. As for critical social justice, that's of course my expertise. That's what I read all day, every day. Um, it is a whole worldview. You have to kind of understand that, and, and then, then you can understand the game it plays. And from within, it's actually somewhat consistent. It intentionally uses inconsistency sometimes, but that's part of the set of, you know, Alice in Wonderland rules it uses. But it makes enough sense. I mean, I can predict things that they're going to do. You know, when an event happens, I predict what they're going to say. I know what they're going to say. I could say it myself. I write their papers, whatever. Um... From the outside, though, critical social justice doesn't make any sense. It's clown world. It's upside down world. It just doesn't make sense, and it drives you nuts. So in, until you understand it, you can't tolerate it, and it will make you crazy. That it even exists is frustrating. That it's institutionalizing is panic-inducing, and grief and rage and confusion and frustration and getting on social media and causing yourself dissonance spirals. And yeah, it is. It's constantly gaslighting you. It's constantly telling you, 
that the world is a vastly different place and making you trying to make you bend the knee to admit crazy stuff that you know isn't the case because they can break you down psychologically as they do that. Whether they're doing it intentionally for that purpose, no, not usually. It's just how they operate. So it is constantly gaslighting you, but that's on them, not you. So if you get confident in your own knowledge, meaning you understand both them and an alternative a little bit, this all becomes pretty insignificant. It doesn't you're getting gaslighted, but it just kind of annoys you. It's, it doesn't make you crazy. Um, the Trumpism, right wing populism thing is also its own worldview. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't, I don't know for sure, uh, but I don't think it's quite as internally consistent. Critical social justice grew up in the academy. It's old, uh, actually stretches back. Depending on how you want to count it, you could stretch it back into the twenties. You could stretch it back to Marx. So it's old. It's pretty well developed. Uh, I don't think this right wing populism thing, especially in that as populist, is, is as internally consistent, but it is also going to be its own worldview. It has very similar problems, maybe some of the same problems, and is definitely gaslighting us too. Um, but let's focus on critical social justice first, because that's where I'm at home. I want to try to give you a picture of that worldview with all the different relevant pieces, which has all the relevant pieces of an entire worldview. I mean, it's like bigger than a religion. It's actually, it's, it's a complete way of, of understanding reality, which goes well beyond religion. Uh, it has its own metaphysics. It has its own everything. It's, it's a complete way of understanding reality. Um, so worldview in the totalizing sense of the world. Uh, so just some details. If you understand these things, they will make it less crazy inducing. You won't feel like you're eating crazy pills. So I hope I can get some of this across, but it has its own, like it, it has its own theory of knowledge, for example. So you think you know what knowledge is, but it has a completely different understanding of knowledge. So when it talks about knowledge, it actually means something different. It's not some like petty little linguistic shift where they change the definition. They actually have their own theory of knowledge, their own epistemology. They have a completely different understanding of what knowledge is, where knowledge comes from, how knowledge is produced, how knowledge is validated. They have a completely different view. For them, knowledge usually comes from what's what's called um, kind of a, an epistemological system, a way, uh, which is a, a theory of how knowledge works and comes into being. And so they, they usually has kind of what I'm, I'll call, I don't know if these are real terms or not, a positive epistemology, a way for them to forward ideas that are likely to be legitimate and has a negative epistemology, which is a way to um, shave away ideas that aren't valid. So to take the bad ideas out, whatever bad means. So it's positive epistemology is lived experience, in particular the lived experience of political power, and in particular the lived experience of oppression by social systems. It also will forward ideas out of marginalized traditions, thinking that these traditional knowledges from, you know, maybe indigenous tribes or colonial contexts or whatever, they got stamped on were ways of knowing that got oppressed, marginalized, or shut up or something like that, excluded from the, the traditions or from the canon, I should say, of, of Western knowledge. And therefore, those are also forwarded as a type of knowledge. And then it also has a negative epistemology, which is called problematizing. It is trying to find the ways that problematics occur, meaning it uh, causes oppression, it supports oppression, it hurts somebody's feelings, it causes trauma. Um, they, of course, have a very nuanced way of dealing with this. It's all according to the power dynamics. So, and, and according to that, there's a degree of odd cultural relativism. So, a white person couldn't find problematics in a, say, Native American uh, knowledge tradition because that would be an assertion of power that is itself problematic. So, you, even if there were problematics in that from the normal understanding, then you couldn't find them. This is why, for example, when you have Islamists that are abusing women or throwing gays off of roofs, and you think that Western progressives would be all over that, they can't say boo about it because that would be Western imperialism and colonialism in terms of knowledge to try to speak up about it. So, um, nonetheless, these are the, the ways that they handle, they produce knowledge. They forward ideas out of the lived experience of oppression in particular, or resurrect them from marginalized traditional knowledges or knowledge systems, if you will. And then they problematize that which 
needs to be problematized out of them, the problematizing having very specific cultural rules that actually can be made sense of. Um, very important to realize because this is where you get lost and you start thinking you ate crazy pills. For you with knowledge, playing the regular game, truth matters. For them, truth doesn't matter. Whether or not it's problematic matters. That's it. Truth doesn't matter. All that matters is the political relevance in terms of oppression and oppression as they theorize it, which is all via identity. It's hard to switch your brain over to understand that, but when you understand, even understanding that it's the case, you can get away from it making you crazy. It only makes you crazy that truth doesn't matter for them until you understand why truth doesn't matter for them. They have a theory of power and politics. That first of all, that that power and politics and knowledge are basically the same thing. Uh, the way that that we're allowed to speak about things, sometimes called discourses, the way that we're allowed to choose what is true and false about the world, is a political decision for them. They also believe that power is intrinsically corrupting and self-serving. So when I say power here, though, I mean particularly. Being belonging to a social group that is theorized to be dominant. So you, if you understand that if it's a dominant group, that's frankly white, male, straight, able-bodied, thin, Western, uh, American or European, you know, in that context, then we can go on down the list. Judith Butler called it the exasperated, etc. Uh, one of her better turns of phrase, to be honest with you. Um, if you're a member of these dominant groups, then you have an intrinsic corruption and you're always acting in a self-serving way. Uh, and it's it, it takes place with willful ignorance of the realities of that system is how they phrase it. Because if you have power or privilege, you have less motivation to question any of the biases that provide you advantage or uh, any of the systems that you benefit from. Whereas if you aren't granted knowledge by virtue of being oppressed or of an oppressed identity, I should say, but you are much more likely to have it because you have a higher motivation according to theory. So you can actually understand how the theory of politics works is that dominant groups or those with access to power are always acting in the interest of keeping their power. Uh, and those systems of power are rooted in identity. It used to be economics under Marx, but it's not anymore. It has moved to culture. That was the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. And then it has moved from there again into identity and identity politics under critical social justice. So identities are political. Politics works in a particular way. So this actually, when we talked about the Me Too scandal a minute ago, turns out when they say believe all women, what they actually mean is believe all people who have a politically woman identity. And which means people who have the correct politics according to them, which certainly would not go against the electoral chances of their hopes, uh, which would be supporting Trump and thus disqualifying from being on the right side of politics. When we had Joe Biden recently make the uh, comment that some black man who didn't want to vote for him isn't really black, or if you don't like the Joe Biden thing, because I think he was clearly making a joke, we can switch to when Ta-Nehisi Coates called uh, Kanye West no longer black for wearing a MAGA hat and saying that he had a lot in common with President Trump. Um, or you could talk about how Pete Buttigieg wasn't gay the right way because he's not queer. Uh, it turns out that the political identity matters for this. And so... Um, a statement like every like you can't vote for Trump and be black actually makes sense because blackness implies a certain politics and if you're not doing that politics you're not black this actually the point isn't to get into the details of this the point is that when you don't understand this it makes you crazy but when you do understand it you're like oh this crap which is a lot different than being crazy right it doesn't drive you nuts which is what the point here is um they're Theory of politics is that liberation from oppression in all of its forms as they describe them, not in reality, is its top priority. Remember, truth and falsity, reality don't really matter. Their view of the power dynamics of the world is all that matters, and liberation is the top priority. So they get to define oppression. You don't. So if you feel oppressed by them, that's <laughs> because you actually are having white fragility or some, some reaction to liberatory politics, and you're actually contributing to the problem they're trying to solve. This drives you crazy until you understand that it's just how they think about politics. Um, 
they see oppression as ethno-historical, so it doesn't change. Black people cannot suddenly get power over white people in the American context short of a complete social and cultural revolution because the ethno-historical identity black is subjugated by the ethno-historical identity white, and that is a fundamental part of the American fabric. That is how they view. And again, it, when you understand it, it, you don't have to like it. It doesn't make you happy. You don't have to believe it. In fact, it's bullshit. But it doesn't make you crazy. They also have a critical theory of mind. They actually have a theory of mind that is different than yours. The game they play is so much different that they have their own theory of mind. It is born out of Marxism, actually. Uh, it is a false consciousness versus critical consciousness theory of mind. Critical consciousness is the formal or older term that it now is you, woke now stands in place of being woke up is having a critical consciousness according to the criti critical theory in critical social justice. So um, false consciousness can, it, it always supports dominance. So since liberation from dominance or oppression really is the top priority, false consciousness is bad. It's not a real consciousness. Um, if you're dominant, this, this manifests as internalized dominance. So this is mostly your willful ignorance, uh, believing in so-called ideologies like individualism and meritocracy and human nature and biology, uh, and things like that. And it can exist within oppression. They call it internalized oppression, like internalized misogyny, where uh, women aren't being sufficiently feminist enough, so they must have some internalized version of sexism, uh, internalized racism, where black people are, or any other minority race is, is a non-white race. It doesn't even matter if it's minority, because these things are already permanent. Um, where, where they've, they've decided to, as they say, act white or whatever, uh, or to, to participate in the society without being, uh, revolutionary politics against it. Well, that's because they've internalized racism. They've accepted that racism is normal and, and correct. And so they have false consciousness that requires being awakened from. They used to call that consciousness raising. Um, they don't really anymore, but, uh, that's what it is. It's consciousness raising. So critical consciousness is, on the other hand, the awakened state that's out of false consciousness. So that is the theory of mind, is having critical consciousness, which means to actually have a mind, you have to agree with them. And that's how they see it. So you, your, their theory of mind is that you have a mind if you agree with them and you don't have a mind if you don't agree with them because you're not, you do have one, but it's technically completely brainwashed and programmed by by socialization into the systems of power. So a critical consciousness is having uh, an independent mind, which is really funny because that's as, about as Orwellian doublespeak backwards as you can get. You literally have to agree with everything they think in order to have, have your uh, a mind. You can see how this would make you crazy if you don't understand it, but when you understand it, you're like, oh, this, this shit. Um, but anyway, to have a critical consciousness requires you to be an activist, so that's why they're all activists. Uh, if you're dominant, having in a dominant social group, uh, male, white, straight, uh, having a critical consciousness means being aware of having dominance and all the problems it causes and working to disrupt it. That's where you see uh, critical whiteness educator Robin D'Angelo, who wrote White Fragility, a New York Times bestselling book, uh, saying that it's her ambition to, to be less white. Um, she's trying to disrupt whiteness and she's trying to remove whiteness from herself so it's acting in solidarity with oppressed groups and so on and putting their needs and causes first you can see how this is quite the power grab if you are critically conscious and you exist in a oppressed position social position that means you're aware of the oppression you experience and its realities and you realize that it is intolerable and that it causes harm and trauma and so on and you end up in your nice victimhood state and you wallow in your victim's victimhood state so that you can make a politically salient identity like capital b black in order to fight it and that's what you must do and that means having a mind according to the theory of critical social justice. Again, we're not going deep into the details. The point is that if you understand it, it won't make you crazy. But if you have no idea what's going on and you run into this stuff, it is, it's crazy pills. It's clown world. 
except it actually makes sense and you don't have to feel that way if you take some time to understand the basics. So it has a critical theory of person, given that it has a critical theory of mind. Um, you are your political identity, as I just said, that results from your political, uh, that results from your socialization, I should say, in the uh, prevailing society, which is made of, made of, society is made of intersecting systems of power and dominance that cause oppression. So you are a political identity that results from being socialized into these systems of power, uh, ways of speaking and thinking, systems of knowledge. Uh, you're socialized into all of this. You led to make, to believe that it's right and natural and correct, given false consciousness. And then you can uh, wake up from that and have your own politically awake consciousness and become something of, of a person. So, but in general, the view is that you have been made by your unjust society, not born. You were made by society. One becomes a woman, as Simone de Beauvoir put it uh, over half a century ago. Um, where we come back to Robin D'Angelo, this is where she says that no one chose to be socialized into a system of racism, so no one is bad, but no one is neutral. So that also means that it's re you're required to take a side. When I say that you are your political identity, I mean it, and you have to take a side. So people in their theory of person, the critical theory of person, are born free of corrupted power. You can kind of see this noble savage thing is all in there. Um, but those uh, it, who are corrupted by this power aren't really trustworthy. Um, in fact, they need to be awakened or challenged or disrupted or dismantled or whatever it is that they have to be done to. Um, critical consciousness is the signal of now being aware, thus less corrupted, but it's considered an ongoing and lifelong process, so you're never quite all the way uncorrupted from your privilege. Uh, so you are your privilege. Um, this is the theory of person sees, this, of course, all of this mostly through identity politics because that's the central object of critical social justice. So um, your person must be interpreted through theory because that's how the critical theory of mind works, like we just discussed, and you must take a side. And the personal is political, which is the slogan this all was built out of, becomes actually, if you want to summarize it, they don't ever say this, but it, the person is their politics. And there's your Conway, Kanye West is not black anymore, or Pete Buttigieg is not really gay. He might be married to or sleep with a man, but he's not authentically gay because the person is their politics. And if their politics aren't actually full on woke critical social justice politics, they're not actually radical politics in the name of critical social justice using critical theory, then they are not authentic. So you are your politics and you're either on the side, the right side of history, or you have sided with oppression. There is no middle ground. As you read over and over and over again from Robin DiAngelo, from uh, Allison Bailey, from Ibram Kendi, uh, there is no not racist. There is only racist and anti-racist. You have to pick a side. This, of course, has profound implications for personal agency. So it ends up with a through its theory of person, this is where it gets interesting, has a theory of agency um, in this. Uh, members of dominant groups always have agency because they have moral culpability through their false consciousness, which is complicit in the systems of power, and they benefit from them. So that complicity generates moral culpability. Moral culpability implies agency. They're false consciousness or, or their, their ignorance, as it's often called, is on some level always therefore willful. Willful implies, again, agency. So dominant group members in critical social justice always have agency, and even though she said they're not bad, they're bad. Uh, on the other hand, the oppressed lose their agency because of dominance. That's the false consciousness part, but they can regain their agency by becoming critically conscious. So they get a critical consciousness by waking up, becoming woke, and then they can gain agency. And that is achieved by taking on and living and, and acting in service of an active political identity. In other words, by becoming an activist for critical theory rooted in the identity politics factor. So you're only an agent. You only have agency if you're working on behalf 
of critical social justice, or if you happen to be positioned as a member of a dominant group, in which case you are forced to have agency because you have to be held morally culpable for your complicity. Again, the point isn't to dive into this deeply or to really ex explain it all. It's just to say that they think this way, that it's comprehensible, and that when you understand it, it doesn't drive you crazy. I should disclaim, this is actually the pure form of it. This is like unadulterated, uh, you know, 99.99% pure. Most people don't have that level of purity of understanding theory or living theory because it's out of step with reality. So most people have only taken up parts of this. Even the adherents rarely understand it fully. You find people slipping uh, the argument about whether or not uh, black racial identity and black political identity is essentialist or racist or whatever rages even within these communities from people who have different levels of understanding of it. Um, in a sense, this kind of works like a church. You have your theologians, you know, and they basically study this stuff all the time and they're really, really sharp on it. Then you have your priests or pastors who are good, but less sharp. And you have your congregants who take notes and they're pretty good at it. They're really serious. You have the guy who shows up to church every week, but he's, you know, he just shows up, he listens, sings, whatever. And you have those people who kind of come to church a couple times a year. And you have those people who don't ever go to church, but they're still a Christian and a member of the church, maybe. And they all have different levels of sophistication or depth in their understanding, but they all still identify with that religion. And they would all still speak from that worldview in various ways or have taken on various parts of it. Same thing here. I am describing the pure form of critical social justice worldview and different people in different will have taken up different levels of, of, of having accepted this. It's very difficult to keep it all in your mind because it's so antagonistic to reality. Um, switching over very briefly to right-wing populism because I know so much less about this so far. It's do, still fairly new for me to understand it in terms of uh, critical theory approach. The short thing to say is that it is a critical theory of government and administrative power. Um, it is not a... Uh, just a regular skeptical theory. It is a critical theory that sees government and administrative power as a self-serving, illegitimate project in all cases that uh, needs to be disrupted, dismantled, subverted, and so on. That's why you have Trump making memes of the presidency, uh, mocking it, uh, flouting presidential norms, calling people names, and so on, and it being lapped up because they are critical theorists of government and the state and administrative power is being questioned. It particularly forwards an extreme skepticism of empowered experts. Private experts are, are exempted. Uh, they have to be uh, governmental or administrative or institutional because institutional administrative government power corrupts. Uh, so private experts like your dentist are not corrupted by the corrupting power that is at the heart of the critical theory. They have their own slogan, uh, do your own research, uh, very common in conspiracy theory circles. Uh, that's the same as it's my lived experience. Um, it's a different way of forwarding uh, knowledge claims and then vetting which ones are real and not real. I don't know the details of this yet, but do your own research equals it's my lived experience or it's my truth. They're the same thing. Um, so again, a lot of the details that I just discussed for critical social justice will map onto this in one way or another. I haven't done that map. I just wanted to kind of touch on this. It's all probably very interesting and a worthy research project. I haven't had time, but I want to talk about this. The details don't matter. It's that if you understand that this is a worldview, that this is a mindset, that this has an internal logic and that it can be comprehended, it doesn't make you crazy anymore. So the question was, why am I not crazy? Because I have insight into what's actually going on. The Trump thing drove me crazy longer than the critical social justice did. And that's because I understood the critical social justice side first. Once I started to understand the Trump thing, it stopped driving me crazy too. So I'm actually less crazy than I was not that long ago. Um, there's another side to this knowledge thing. So knowing how they think makes you less crazy or make you not go crazy engaging with it. But it really helps to have something to set that against that's um, solid that you can believe in. And I believe in consistent liberal principles. This isn't liberal like left-wing American politics. This is liberal like Scottish liberalism, the, the um, 
the philosophy. It can be people on the right and on the left and the center can all be consistent liberals. Uh, in short, the critical theories I described above, um, in a sense, liquefy the world. Uh, two metaphors for that that have been developed at length. One is a book by the Polish, I think, philosopher Zygmunt Bauman, which I recently read. It was the difficult philosophy that I was reading while I was listening to The Weed Eater. Um, and his claim is that these things have... Well, he, he is a critical theorist, so it's a little bit complicated, but... His claim is that the f social and political forces and media forces over the last century or so have liquefied, or actually that the whole modernity project is one of liquefying solids. So it, it, we now live in a very liquid, in terms of how power flows, a very liquid environment, and people are constantly discontented because they're looking for somewhere solid to grab onto or put their feet. Another comes from... Uh, Thomas de Zengotita's book Mediated, which talks about how the, it's from 2006 actually, quite early, and it talks about how the media takes everything and packages it and repackages it, and you have to watch 37 versions of everything on cable news over the course of the, like the first 48 hours or whatever, and it's a different story and a different story and a different story. We just saw this with, um, the, the young black man who was shot in Georgia. Uh, you see just the, step after step after step after step after step of, oh, well, here's another detail changing the story. The whole context is different. Oh, look, he did this. Oh, look, he did that. Oh, look, but this. And so this constant repackaging uh, there gets referred to as a blob. It is the blob. The media is the blob. And we all participate in the blob. And the blob takes all of our information, our experiences, our understanding of the world, and it digests it and makes it part of itself to just to go out and digest more. It's a great metaphor. So anyway, still digestive juices, corrosive liquids, whatever you want to think of, you know, melting forces, whatever. We're in a very liquid state and we're all looking for something where we can put a foot on solid ground. So having that helps you not go crazy. If you feel like everything's liquid and slipping out from under your feet, you're losing your marbles. But if you have, if you have a place to put your feet on solid ground, you can stay not crazy. And I do. It is consistent liberal principles. It's in understanding liberal systems in answer to these illiberal systems that are dominating everything we run into now. That starts with believing that things can be known and can be understood. The truth is out there, and we can know something about it. We don't have to know everything. We don't have to have a complete theory of a thing to know something about it. So the truth is out there, and we can know something about it. We can actually get better and better at knowing things about things if we work at it. And there are ways to do that, and they work. I believe in this. You should believe in this. It's true. All the proof is everywhere around us. Um, so... Solid ground can be found in believing that there is a better way to deal with the problems that we see that are causing things like critical social justice and the Trump phenomenon to gain so much power. Identity issues, social justice, government failure, corruption, all of these have possible solutions. That's solid ground to put your feet on. And we have already developed many very successful methodologies, and we're very clever and have developed all these methodologies, so we can probably uh, develop more methodologies that will actually work to solve these problems without just trying to melt everything and deconstruct everything and subvert everything and dismantle and all of this nasty critical stuff we, that's making everybody nuts. And we don't have to listen to the news you know, turn it, the, the blob of the news come in and mediate everything for us and tell us a new version of it every 20 minutes. We can unplug from that and protect ourselves from that. Uh, as far as liberalism goes, though, there are, it has its own ways to understand knowledge, minds, people, agency, politics. Um, knowledge is certainly elusive under liberal approaches. It's difficult. It's a very difficult, <laughs> unlike in, say, critical social justice, where what they call knowledge is as easy as saying it. It is actually hard to get to truths about the universe. It is hard to pry the diamonds of truth out of the fabric of the universe. It's just very difficult. But we're getting, we're, we're quite good at it, and we are still prying truths out of the universe. So it, it works. You, you just have to do the work. You have to be willing to build something. You have to be willing to get educated. You have to be willing to get, become skilled. I didn't say you have to go to the university if that's what you meant by it, you thought I meant by educated. You have to be willing to become competent and to apply your competence to something other than complaining. Then, 
knowledge becomes possible. It's never easy, but it's possible. The liberal system of knowledge production, however, is not easy to live with. It's very frustrating. It's slow, it's difficult, and it hurts your feelings all the time. It makes you feel stupid all the time, and get over it. So what do we have? We have philosophy, right? So philosophy has a, liberal philosophy has a backbone of testing each idea by each other idea. Nobody gets special authority. Nobody gets to be a priest and come in and say, well, I've said so. And because of the power vested in me, therefore it's true. And nobody gets final say. Nobody says, ah, oh, well, this is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and it'll never change. Okay? Every idea is subject to be defeated by new ideas or better ideas or careful analysis. And as long as you maintain that, what tends to happen is we, if we use rigorous methodologies, get closer and closer to truth. You can't get confused and reintroduce something like problematizing, making it so that it hurts my feelings. Feelings don't matter here. We're, we're talking about truth. The whole thing, I get made fun of, you get made fun of, everybody's made fun of for quoting Ben Shapiro on facts don't care about your feelings. The thing is that that is actually true and it cuts both ways. Facts don't care about feelings. Feelings don't care about facts. It, it, both things are true. Both things actually have some profundity. Uh, and when we're playing the liberal knowledge game, your feelings aren't on that table. They're relevant in lots of parts of your life, but they're not during the knowledge game. You get me? Your feelings are relevant in lots of, lots of situations, most of your situations, not when you're playing the knowledge game. They have to be left at the door to go play knowledge. Um, in science, or even harsher, not only do we have that uh, process that I just described, the philosophical process and the theoretical side of science, but then we have the empirical side of science that requires that we check it against reality. As uh, Richard Feynman famously said, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, if it disagrees with the experiment, it is wrong. That's called falsification. So we have to suck it up. If the world says that our belief about the world is wrong, then we were wrong. The world wasn't wrong. Uh, critical social justice loves to pretend that the world is wrong and their, their fancy little theory can't be, but that's totally backwards. Um, but we can check against the world. How do we know if our methods are good? Well, that's what I just described with the philosophy thing. We have each person checking. Everybody who wants to participate and check can check. It's just that feelings don't disqualify. Uh, one's feelings just don't disqualify ideas or approaches or methodologies. Uh, it actually has to come down to getting results. And this actually works. We all know it works. I don't have to list all the reasons we know it works. They're all around us. They're all obvious. 500 years of the, la the last 500 years of history are unambiguous in terms of it working. It works. And it, we know it works. It doesn't, it's not all of life. It doesn't have to be all of life. But when we want to play the knowledge game, it works and it's real and we can do it. So you can believe in this. You don't have to do it all the time, but when you decide to do it, you can do it. That's a piece of rock to put your feet under in this liquid topsy turvy world. Um, as far as like lived experience goes, that's the, the positive philosophy or positive epistemology, I should say, in critical social justice, lived experience is the very first step in generating knowledge, but it's not the last step. You're not done. Interpretation through theory is, in fact, a second step in many cases, but then it's only as good as the theory, and there are many steps. So if the theory is poor, you're not done. You need to do better. There are many steps. And in short, the social justice thing, it's not hard to read this all day, but it's a very immature theory. It's not that, I mean, it's, it's almost like it doesn't even matter if it's right or wrong. It is very wrong in most of its things. It does also identify some things correctly. But the point is that it's a very immature theory. It is not robust. It does not actually have good methodologies for figuring out what's going on in the world. Um, it takes the first two steps in epistemology, it does them relatively badly using a poor theory, and it declares itself done. And it hasn't even begun. It hasn't even done the it hasn't even done the relevant parts yet. And it isn't equipped to. And it doesn't know how to. And the people who rel or who like spend most of their time in it don't know how to either. Even the scientists they've abandoned knowledge production when they start picking this stuff up because it's activism. It's not knowledge. Um, the liberal knowledge production program is not easy. Um, 
truth is that most of our interpretations, guesses, and theories about the world are wrong. The liberal knowledge production process is, in fact, you know, open to checking each by each. So anybody could be um, the one who's figuring something out. So we can't have arguments to authority. But expertise still matters. Expertise is a regulating function here. Expertise doesn't mean you're always right. Expertise means that you have a lower chance of being wrong and a higher chance of knowing the right methods to minimize how wrong you are. So experts get things wrong, but they get things wrong less often than non-experts. That's the definition of an expert, and it's okay. It plays an important role. We need to uh, elevate and pay attention to experts, and part of why we're all crazy right now is that we've forgotten who's an expert, and we don't know how to tell, so we don't know who to listen to. That makes you crazy. If you believe in expertise as a principle, however, that's a piece of rock you can put your feet on and we can start looking for figuring out who those experts are and how to, to vet them, not just because they agree with our politics, but because they are using rigorous methods. Um, politics within liberal systems is loud and it's messy. Um, you have to make the case. You can't, you can't just say it and be done. You have to make the case. No special authority. Appealing to the populace is a central part of that in politics. You have to convince people. Um, at the point of how a democratic system works, the government, the governance is by the people. So the authority lies with the people. So you have to convince the people. You have to convince enough of the people to vote for either the resolution or, uh, for the politician who's, who's going to try to enact it. And we have a system for that. You can't force people to agree with you in, in liberal politics. You have to convince them. You have to put forth the argument. Um, and there is some separation of moral law and secular law that's necessary. In, in secular states, which I think are very important and necessary, we don't come out and say, well, you know, uh, I have, we, or we do a little bit, but we really, it's generally frowned upon to come out and, and argue from, say, the Bible or from some other religious text, or in fact, from, it should be from even something like uh, the critical social justice uh, liberation moral code that that's not enough. You don't just get to appeal to moral law and conflate it with secular law and, and everything's going to be okay. We don't do that in, in liberal politics. Um, we also recognize that straight democracy goes awry, so we, we need intervention by experts. Those experts should be accountable to the people, of course. This is called republicanism. Things are complicated. This is where your critical government studies come in because administrators are often not directly accountable to the people, but indirect accountability can still count as accountability. This is a point where it can be discussed, debated, and things can be figured out. But if you just kind of blanketly say, no, that's always wrong, yeah, you're taking crazy pills and you're feeding them to other people. Point is, though, in, in liberal politics, it is hard to find the signal and the noise. So that's why I'm telling you, you really, if you want to participate in this and not lose your marbles, you, you do want to minimize the noise, both the noise you're hearing and the noise you're making. Kind of stay out of the noise. Um, liberalism has its own theory of mind. Um, it has lots of theories of mind, actually. Uh, people get to debate those and discuss them. But in general, it views that people have their own minds and can use them. Uh, the false consciousness game is therefore going to be a kind of mind reading that's not really allowed in the... Uh, the, the liberal theory of mind, that's kind of why it feels like they're playing some bogus game. Um, you'll often hear that, you know, well, you know, white fragility is unfalsifiable or something like that. It's even indefeasible uh, so that it's not valid as the implication is because it's outside of the liberal game, which uh, gives people the, the benefit of having actual consciousness and the ability to use their mind. Um, in this light, of course, critical consciousness becomes a kind of bias, which is how I described it earlier anyway. Uh, so it's not a step away from bias. It is not awakening. It is actually locking yourself into a program. But uh, generally speaking, to stay light, liberal theory of mind, is, your mind is what makes you you. You are an individual with your own mind, and you can think and do as you will. Uh, theory of person and liberalism kind of sees people on three levels at once. And I know this is dragging a bit long, so I don't want to go into too much, but it does see people on three levels, not just one. Critical social justice only sees you in terms of your social group. Other approaches often see you only in terms of your political group. Um, the three levels are the individual, the universally human, and as a member of social groups. As individuals, the person is atomic, 
He has his own mind, his own character, his own actions that determine his own fate to the best of his ability. There is no essentialism. People are not how they are born. There is meritocracy. There is responsibility uh, you have to take. You are your own person. There's also a level that liberalism recognizes universal humanity. All people share something in common. So that gives a justification for some idea of what human rights are. But we also have to recognize that uh, rights are secured within functional states. So they have to exist within states. Uh, the universal humanity view actually reinforces individualism mutually. They reinforce each other because it centers difference in one's content of character and action. What you, who you are, what you think, and what you do with what you think and who you are matters in liberalism. So that's part of being universally human, but it reinforces being an individual as well. But liberalism also recognizes that humans exist in social groups. This is all critical social justice sees. So here in liberalism, groups are relevant. They don't supersede the individual or the universal. Um, those groups can be political, but if they are, they should actually be defined in terms of relevant politics. Uh, in other words, again, content of character and thought define who you are, not some uh, demographic fact about you. Um, and liberalism, uh, it, liberalism as, a, as, a, as an approach tends to underestimate the importance of social groups in terms of uh, its kind of theory of uh, person. And uh, people, on the other hand, can tend to overestimate the importance of this dimension if they are like critical social justice progressive types or completely underestimated if they are uh, libertarians, um, for example. So that's a point where some efforts needed. Nevertheless, we do have a theory of mind. We do understand individualism, universal humanity. We do understand that people operate in social groups and that that has some influence on them in liberalism. And so there is a sound theory there that you can lean into and put your feet on. If you understand liberal principles, liberal ethics, then you have a place to, to hang out and not get washed away into crazy. And that's how I stay not crazy. Um, of course, this gives us a theory of agency. Um, it mostly resides in the individual with the person's responsibility. Uh, thus, liberalism is generally anti-coercion. Um, there is, of course, something to be said about being duped or manipulated, but the individual is often still held at least partially, if not totally responsible in those situations, depending. But we have a very complicated legal architecture that allows remuneration if we get duped or something like, for example, if we have, uh, we have very, very good, in most cases, consumer protection laws against fraudulent products, for example. Um, there are, of course, questions that remain about civic and social responsibility as far as agency goes. Um, but at the end of the day, the liberal sees the agency as the as a property of the individual. Uh, the fact that this is an imperfect way to conceive of it uh, leaves open the door to these immature critical theories. Um, so maybe some work is needed there, but it's interesting work. So... Where's the rock here is that this all actually really works. It, it actually does tether to reality, as uh, my friends like to say. It actually does work. Um, why does it work is because liberalism is actually a system of conflict management. That's what it exists to do. It is not its own philosophy. In a sense, it is a system of conflict management. Um, when I say philosophy, it's not like its own myth or meta narrative or whatever these postmodern people talk about. It is actually a system of conflict management that can allow for a lot of different forms. That's why you have right-wing conservative liberals, you have centrist liberals, you have left liberals, you have progressive liberals. You can have all kinds of liberals who are still liberal. You can even have liberal religious people who adhere to secularism and understand that it protects the church to be separated from the state, as well as it protects the state to not have the church calling the shots. Liberalism is something different. It is a system of conflict management, and it is something people can agree to. It resolves conflicts, particularly with a minimum of violence and coercion. Uh, in philosophy, we talked about how that works. Ideas are put forward. People debate them. 
people discuss them, people try to overturn them, and so on. And there's this general rule that ideas will be checked each by each. Nobody has special authority. There is no final say. In science, it's the same thing. And now we're going to add in deferring to the harsh reality of nature uh, and see what nature says about our ideas. In law, we have many liberal systems. I mentioned that briefly a second ago. Some key ones that kind of come up around here are due process of law. Um, so we're going to be presumed innocent, uh, not guilty. And then there will be a process of law with different standards of evidence required for different kinds of accusations. And that's how that will proceed, trying to hew toward understanding the reality of the situation as clearly as possible, which we all believe and agree can be done to a reasonable degree. There are loopholes or gaps in this that cause problems, and we can keep working on minimizing those. Uh, we, we tend to forward in liberal systems equality before the law. We don't forward equity, where we adjust shares to make people equal after. Um, we tend to hold a reasonable person standard when we have to try to do something that's fuzzy, so something that can't be objective, like forwarding evidence. We might bring up a reasonable person standard. Uh, what would a reasonable person think about this? Critical theories basically say there are no reasonable people. There are only people who have either critical consciousness, who are by definition <coughs> reasonable, uh, or there are people who have false consciousness. And those people are, by definition, not reasonable people. In postmodernism, there's no such thing as reason anyway, so there is no reasonable person at all. So there's no such standard that's not good. Uh, critical social justice is not good for uh, law in liberal societies. It will actually dissolve it. It will make it dysfunctional uh, and self-serving and corrupt. Um, we have approaches to ethics, again, debate, discussion, uh we do listen to people's feelings. We do listen to the harms that things cause. We do care about those things when we start weighing out ethics. We do in law, actually, as well, and they can be studied by science and in philosophy. This is all fine, and it can be done within a liberal, liberal context. Um, we also have uh, interesting approaches to culture and liberalism. In, in particular, we tend now, in the present day, to hew toward pluralism, and this has to be characterized against multiculturalism. Uh, pluralism is this idea that many different cultures can kind of meet, mix, mingle, and exist within a single political entity like a state, uh, and they can do what they want. And then, of course, this is vigorously re rejected and resisted under multiculturalism because that would cause cultures to blur and mix and, and, and be distorted, which, according to the theory of critical social justice, which supports multiculturalism, uh, would be dominance controlling and stealing from this cultural appropriation and uh, colonization all of the other cultures and so that can't be done so you have to preserve those uh, minoritized cultures while chipping away at dominant culture and this is what passes under multiculturalism which resists people understanding one another and in fact forwards the idea that they can't understand one another but then they have to live in the same place so this is why you see them in, in the present day searching for segregation again uh, as a means of uh, trying to preserve culture. Um, in liberalism as a system of conflict management, though, what the common thread there is, is that it's always interested in reality. It's always interested in making things actually work, understanding what's really there, understanding how things really work. It's not interested in putting theory ahead of reality. It actually believes in reality and cares about reality and works to make reality central to what's going on. Um, so therefore it subjects social phenomena like politics, society, culture, law, knowledge, production, economics, and so on uh, to these kinds of processes, which actually means that it sets up some infrastructure for conflict management and liberalism enables an evolutionary process to come into these domains that creates the opportunity for optimizing according to the given conditions, which might change over time. Um, that's a very good system of conflict management. What it says is that reality is what it is. Reality changes. Circumstances change. We're going to go according to the situation. And here's how we're going to 
We're going to manage conflict when it comes up. So you forward an idea, I forward an idea, they disagree. We have a system to adjudicate that. If it's in philosophy, you have to put forth the best argument, and I have to put forth mine, and we'll have a debate, and we'll see what happens. If it's science, we'll check it against reality. We'll do the experiment. We'll see who's right, if either one of us are. If it's in law, then we will have a hearing. We'll we'll take it to court. We'll do something of that kind. Um we have processes. The law exists to adjudicate a conflict between citizens in a non-violent, non-coercive way. This is how liberal societies work. Liberalism is a very effective system of conflict management that is actually self-critical. It does allow itself to change uh, as needed, and so it subjects human systems to evolutionary processes that can actually end up creating optimal solutions uh, or allowing individuals to optimize their opportunities within those situations. Um, critical theories have their own conflict management system instead, um, in particular with critical social justice. It is that liberal approaches cause oppression. Um, all of them feel this way, actually. Just uh, liberalism allows the creation of oppression. So the uh, lived experience of oppression replaces uh the, the rigorous debate necessary, um, concerns like problematics, being silenced, upholding oppression become the most relevant issues uh, for whether or not something is going to be considered, uh, how we're going to resolve the conflict, I should say. So conflicts are resolved by problematizing, consulting positionality, and doing a very subjective tribal uh, analysis that's ultimately disinterested in reality in terms of objective reality or making things work. It's actually only interested in subjective feelings of oppression and how one might be liberated possibly only in the moment from those. It is a broken and dysfunctional method. Uh, it removes social phenomena from an evolutionary process that's rooted in reality and places them in a different evolutionary system that's rooted in subjective experience, which is kind of um, going to end up being willy-nilly. It's going to be uh, the thing that they claim that they're fighting. It's going to be creating a world in which power, political power, determines truth. Might makes right is at the end of that road, it, which becomes a very bad conflict management solution because people are going to reject it. And if they gain enough might, they will make themselves right by some other means outside of the liberal conflict management system that minimizes violence and coercion. The problem also, of course, is that reality bats last, and people will notice this. They will tend to, because for them and in their um, individual lives, reality is going to be the thing that they run into repeatedly when their beliefs are false. So if you force them to believe false things, it's not going to work, and they're going to get pissed off about it, and they're going to generate conflict. And if you don't have a good conflict resolution or management system, like liberalism, you're in for a big problem. Um, reality, as it turns out, of course, doesn't go away just because you don't like it or don't believe in it. So the result is that a conflict management system like is forwarded by critical social justice or other critical theories, including the critical theory and Marxism, as we all know, require totalitarianism to hold things together for as long as that can last because one subjective standard can't be held above others in any other way. If it's all subjective standards and uh, it requires force and coercion and violence to make sure that one of those is held above the others. So totalitarianism is a necessity in a critical system like Marxism or like... Uh, critical social justice. So let's summarize. How do I stay sane? That was the original question here, right? These are the things I understand. I said that understanding these things makes me not go crazy. So number one, I unplug appropriately. I stay light on the news. I do no cable news. Zero. I don't even watch clips of cable news that people share. No cable news. And I mostly ignore politics. I kind of look at it in the rearview mirror of a few days or a little longer. Uh, it really helps. Um, secondly, I understand the crazy stuff. First of all, this is really all you have to understand. It is decipherable. I'm making resources, by the way, of course, on new discourses that help you decipher it. My social justice encyclopedia is probably key among those. Um, 
This doesn't take deep understanding, but knowing that it is decipherable will help you not go crazy. It is not you losing your mind. The world has kind of gone crazy, but you can actually understand how, and then if that's the case, knowledge is power, you can start taking steps to undo it, but it will keep you from going crazy to understand how it works. I also understand the antidote to the crazy, consistent liberal principles, knowing that they work, knowing that we've achieved them in the past against massive superstition and irrationality, and that we can get back to them, and knowing that they hold the moral high ground because they work, they solve problems. Instead of creating more problems and having to institute totalitarianism to kind of try to suppress them, they actually solve problems. If you want to solve problems like racism, I can tell you right now, liberal methods work better than critical methods. If you want to solve a problem uh, like government corruption, liberal methods work. They work. You can rest in that. That's the moral high ground. These other people, these critical people, do not have the moral high ground. So we don't have to listen to them as though they have the moral high ground. So you, you kind of lose your mind when you don't really understand the things that are happening around you for what they are, and when you don't understand how else you could possibly be. So I probably feel the least crazy when I'm focusing on understanding the crazy and doing my work. Uh, I feel the most crazy when I start feeling stuck having to live in other people's thoughts all the time. And that When does that happen? When I look at the news, especially if I then interact with it on the internet, when I pay too much attention to politics, especially if I interact with it on the internet, and when I start engaging with my social media notifications too much, that forces me to live in other people's thoughts and I start losing my marbles. So it, by comparison, how do I not stay sane? Too much news, too much politics, too much social media interaction. Uh, it, rather than just the fun kind, which is mostly okay, but still wears you down. So rather than telling you to de-stress, to go outside, or do whatever, I'm trying to tell you that you want to minimize your exposure to cognitive dissonance. One, by learning what you're about. Consistent liberal principles, I hope. Two, by learning what the stuff that seems incomprehensible is about. I'm providing resources, for, uh, critical social justice, for example. And three, by doing as much as you can to minimize exposure to cognitive dissonance loops and downward spirals, which means don't argue on the internet for one thing and try to try to not, especially about things like politics and this, this crazy stuff. It's not helping. It's just dragging noise into your head. Um, it is possible to stay sane in this world with all this stuff going on. Uh, in fact, the stuff that's driving you nuts feeds on you going crazy. It feeds on craziness. It feeds on polarization. It feeds on cognitive dissonance and our reactions to it. And the media amplifies every bit of it and just drives us all more crazy. You can step away from the cycle though. If you want to turn the knob down on all of it, you can. And we need to, to stay sane. That's how I stay sane. So get a grip then on your consistent liberal principles, on the machinations of these illiberal programs that are trying to take over the public space and their upside down crazy town logic and on your consumption of news politics comment section type cognitive dissonance that's how i stay sane that's how you can stay sane too thanks for listening